Today I'd like to tell you about LiveNote, an in-concert mobile app developed in collaboration between Drexel University and the Philadelphia Orchestra. Over its 114-year history, the Philadelphia Orchestra has assembled a rich history of technical innovation and experimentation. It was the first orchestra to record a soundtrack for a film when Leopold Stokowski and the orchestra collaborated with Bell Labs and Disney in the making of Fantasia. The making of the soundtrack employed new technology that was the precursor to stereo recordings. The Philadelphia Orchestra was the first orchestra to be broadcast on TV in 1948. The fabulous Philadelphians were also the first orchestra to cybercast concert audio in 1997 and the first to multicast concerts in HD and Dolby surround sound over Internet 2 in 2007. And again in 2014, the Philadelphia Orchestra did something that no other major orchestra in the world had ever done. The orchestra invited its patrons to take out their smartphones and use them during Philadelphia Orchestra subscription concerts to follow content specifically made for the music on stage. The orchestra music director, guest conductors, administrators, and concert masters encouraged their listeners from the podium and on social media to watch slides of content that were curated and aligned to the exact measure of the music being played on stage. When the app launched, there were no riots, mass walkouts, or hordes of ticket buyers wanting their subscriptions refunded. Instead, there were healthy debates about Live Note's place in the concert hall, about its effect as a possible distractor to fellow audience members, and excitement about what constitutes compelling content for a real-time in-concert app. Live Note forced the Philadelphia Orchestra to question if there really is one proper way to consume live orchestra content in the concert hall, or if perhaps there were chances created by mobile technology to allow patrons a way to find out more about the music on stage while preserving, extending, or even changing the traditional in-concert classical music experience. What is the problem that Live Note is trying to solve? To many classical music patrons, musician ensembles, and arts administrators, a concert hall is a sacred space where the patron is expected to be a passive listener. The patron is discouraged from interacting during the performance aside from applauding during key points in the beginning and the end of the piece. For most of the experience, the concert goer is expected to focus on the musicians on stage or to meditate on what is conjured by the mind as a result of listening. The musicians focus on their conductor and instruments and the arts administrators provide an environment that delivers a high fidelity acoustic transmission to the patrons in their seats. The silence of the patron is part of the purity of the experience because the patron does not actively color the interpretation by his or her reaction or interaction during the performance. At the time of the concert, the patron must bring his or her own knowledge of the piece being performed. If the patron does not have that knowledge, the patron has the option to read the playbill performance notes or perhaps attend a pre-concert lecture. These opportunities usually happen before the concert begins and rarely does the delivery of this educational content directly tie to the real-time experience of the orchestra on stage. This is the traditional and widely accepted method of consuming live classical music. Today's entertainment consumers do not have the patience or attention span to enjoy a concert in a unisensory fashion, nor are they accustomed to limiting their participation during the event. Moreover, patrons do not have the base knowledge of core repertoire that would support the patients required to sit for 90 minutes and stare at a classical music ensemble. The elusive new patron most likely has never attended an orchestra concert, does not know the composer of the piece being performed, cannot name all of the instruments on the stage, has no idea what the significance of the piece is, and is not encouraged to explore these questions during the concert. These facts about new patrons are uncomfortable, because they signal a shift in our culture and education, a shift that the classical music performing arts venues are having a hard time adapting to. So it follows that a group of students from Drexel University who were first-time classical music listeners inspired Live Note or iNotes as it was originally named. After attending a Philadelphia Orchestra concert broadcast over Internet 2 with the students, Dr. Youngmoo Kim polled his students and realized that many of them had no classical music experience and felt lost throughout the pieces. Dr. Kim envisioned ways to present additional background information to novice listeners. Shortly thereafter, the orchestra, in conjunction with Drexel University, 
applied for and received a grant for $150,000 in April of 2011 from the Knight Foundation with matching grants from the NEA and others. Under the direction of Dr. Young Moo Kim and lead developers Matt Prokop, David Grunberg, and Alex Hibrick, Drexel created the iNotes content management system, multicast server, and iPhone app. This was the core of the LiveNote technology. But LiveNote was not immediately deployed in 2011 in reaction to newly mobile crazed audiences. It took three years for LiveNote to get into the hands of an actual ticket buying audience member. The culprits behind this delay were technical, institutional, and cultural. But before I tell you that story, let me tell you what the app does and how it works. Put as simply as possible, LiveNote is a slideshow that syncs with live music. You can view different slideshows or tracks depending on your interest. Each slide in a track is tied to a specific measure of music. The slides advance automatically as the music is performed. There is a timeline that shows you the structure of the music and hyperlinks that take you to a glossary of musical terms. Administrators create content. This content is in the form of pictures and text that complement the music. The pictures and text are put into rows in a spreadsheet to form a slide. Each slide is associated with a measure number of the real piece. Typically, when content creators create the spreadsheet, they listen to the piece to make sure they create an experience that is not too busy. Tracks are comprised of separate storylines or slideshows of content, which the user can select to follow during the performance. Once the spreadsheet is created, it is uploaded into the LiveNote Content Management System, or LiveNote CMS. This CMS serves as a content editor and a database repository for the content to be available for use by the LiveNote application. Pieces for the nice performance are kept in a current pieces table in the database. Also on the LiveNote server is the LiveNote Multicast server. This is the actual server that distributes the piece and measure number to the audience over the Wi-Fi network in the hall. When patrons are in Verizon Hall, the multicast server creates a data stream that sends the measure number of the current piece being performed to the app. The multicast server can also push alerts on the CMS to patrons in real time. To actually use LiveNote, the patron must download the app from the Play or Apple Store. If the app is downloaded away from Verizon Hall, the app will contain an example piece that demonstrates the content the patron can expect to see at the concert. Our example content is Strauss's Don Juan. The app is really designed to be used in the venue where the user finds the LiveNote wireless network and connects to the network to download the current pieces for the night's concert. Once downloaded, the patron is messaged that the piece is live and the slides advance automatically once the actual content starts. On the stage, a microphone picks up the music and sends a signal to a detection server. This server uses an algorithm to determine the current measure that the orchestra is playing. The current measure is updated in the CMS database, and then the multicast server sends this measure number out to the app on the patron's phone. Alternatively, a manual process, usually in the form of a person reading the score, can advance the measures if the music detection server is not available. Either way, when the phone receives the current measure from the network, it displays the content that is associated with that measure. The end result is that the patron sees the automatic advancement of content slides that correlate to specific points in time in the piece. The patron can pick different tracks of content based on his or her interest. After the concert, the content stays in the app and can be reviewed by the patron at home. Okay, so now you know how it works, let's rewind to 2011 and I'll tell you why LiveNote was such a struggle to launch. As with any new technology, there were bugs, user interface issues, and infrastructure improvements that had to be made, and these took time to address. The user interface was clunky. The brightness of the screen was an issue. The ringer of the phone could not be turned off when the app launched. This was a constraint of all Apple devices. In fact, Initially, we planned to have patrons borrow an orchestra-owned mobile device with LiveNote on it and ask for it back after the show. And probably the most disconcerting, the app did not stay connected to the Wi-Fi. When this was the case, the app slides would not advance. So in response to these technical issues, we found a design and user experience partner and developed a new interface that minimized distraction. We went from this to this. 
we developed a new in-app messaging feature that told concertgoers to turn their ringer off. Shortly thereafter, we gave up on orchestra-owned devices and launched the app in the store in March of 2014. And to solve the signal dropping issues, we conducted a wireless survey and then expanded and tuned our existing wireless infrastructure to accommodate 28 additional access points in Verizon Hall. Though the technical issues took time and were hard to solve, there were institutional hurdles that had nothing to do with getting the LiveNote app to work properly. The orchestra went through a very public reorganization process in 2011. The organization was worried that the app would cause patrons to want subscription refunds. The artistic department was not staffed to create content for the app and the content that needed to be created was qualitatively different from program notes. The app needed to have an orchestra brand. So in response to these institutional hurdles, we put the LiveNote app in testing mode while the orchestra successfully emerged from Chapter 11 bankruptcy. We dedicated money in our budget for refunds should the first LiveNote concert turn out to be a huge distraction to longtime benefactors. Thankfully, our patrons for the most part accepted our experimentation and did not call for refunds. In terms of content, we quickly came to realize that what makes compelling content is not necessarily the traditional program notes in the printed program. We wanted to create a more personal artistic experience with its own unique editorial voice, one designed to connect people with the wealth of stories behind music rather than taking a more academic approach. We worked with several writers before turning to a veteran producer of classical music media, Ben Rowe, who spent more than two decades producing award-winning music programs for National Public Radio. Jeremy Rothman and Roger White of our artistic department worked closely with Ben to shape and refine Ben's content. They also contributed their own content and provided editorial support to the overall ongoing process. In response to branding challenges, we created a logo that was based on the current orchestra logo and then hired a firm to help us rename the app from iNotes to LiveNote. And finally, the biggest impediment to rolling out Live Note was surmounting the fear from our audiences and stakeholders around changing the orchestra's culture. How would the audiences that had loyally supported us for years react to mobile phones' use being encouraged in their sacred space? Communication was key. We approached our musicians first back in 2012 for approval to move forward. Then we approached our conductor, Yannick. The musicians in Yannick were positive about the app and made one thing clear. They wanted us to move forward and finish out Live Note to its conclusion. No going halfway. We gave early glimpses of the app to our volunteers who embraced the concept immediately and became spokespeople on the app's behalf. We talked to our maestro, Circle Donors, and let them test during an open rehearsal. We took questions from our donors after the concert and addressed their concerns. We spent a lot of time talking to people about what we were trying to do and we got their buy-in. Though Live Note was introduced in our regular subscription concerts in 2014, the orchestra also launched a Live Note Night series, comprised of three concerts in early winter of 2015. This series introduced new concert format that differed from our traditional offerings. There was a comedic short film introducing the concert. It had conductors speaking from the stage. The program length was one hour, the seating was first come first serve, and the ticket price was discounted. We actually had our artistic director, Yannick, encouraging the audience from the stage to download the app. This was a place outside of our traditional concert program to experiment with Live Note. It was like creating a tweet concert out of a season instead of creating a tweet section within one concert. While these concerts varied in popularity, we were able to survey our audiences to see how well the concerts were received and how the patrons adjusted to our culture change. The findings were interesting. We surveyed our audience during the Live Note Night series, and this is what they said about the app. The app had a very strong impact on patron interest in attending more concerts. We used net promoter scores when we surveyed our audiences. The net promoter score is an indication of how many people will actively recommend or censure your product. The net promoter score for the app increased for each successive concert for Live Note Nights. The interesting thing we learned from our surveys through Net Promoter Scores was that people who use the app promote it and people who don't use it do not promote it. We learned in order to increase adoption, we had to get it into people's hands. 
Yes, some were utterly uninterested or thought it was distracting, but these were the folks who usually did not try it. They were also in the minority. And as far as analytics goes, we are finding that the take rate of the app is about 10 to 20 percent, depending on the type of concert and attendance. On November 14th of 2015, we had a high of 314 people using the app in a sold-out subscription concert. The average age of attendees for these concerts skews older, dispelling the myth that boomers are not interested in using this technology. So is yielding to the mobile onslaught the answer to holding the new classical music listener's attention? Isn't mobile the original cause of our attention spans being shorter than a goldfish's? Perhaps, but in all likelihood, LiveNote is only part of a much larger response that performing arts institutions are now trying to formulate. LiveNote attempts to address patrons who want more information about the art form by delivering context on a platform that most of the public now takes for granted. The larger solution goes beyond one app in a concert hall and involves an overall commitment nationally to education and a reevaluation of how entertainment can and should be consumed in public venues. Going forward, the orchestra and Drexel University plan to share LiveNote and get feedback from the classical music world on its use. Soon, we hope to make an announcement that will allow organizations to use LiveNote in their concert halls, opera houses, or performing arts centers. Here at the Philadelphia Orchestra, we are very excited about the start we have made in trying to address our new, young, and changing audiences. Once LiveNote is available to our colleagues, we are excited to see how the app can hopefully strengthen classical music appreciation, education, and attendance with music lovers in concert halls around the world. Thank you for listening to me speak about LiveNote.